Hi there and welcome to this new and exciting session in which we shall be treating or we shall be using this transformer network right here to solve problems in computer vision and more specifically in the task of image classification. Up until this point, we've seen different convolutional neural networks like the LUNET, the VGG, the ResNet, the mobile net, the efficient net. And now we'll be looking at the vision transformers. These vision transformers were first developed in this paper entitled An Image is What 16 by 16 Words, where they build transformers for image recognition at scale. In this section, we'll take a deep dive into how this whole architecture here has been constructed and how it works, and also how and why transformers perform as well as their convolutional neural network counterparts. Don't forget to subscribe and hit that notification button so you never miss amazing content like this. The very first point you want to note here is the usage of transformers for computer vision tasks has been developed in very recent times. You could see here from this date this paper was published. The authors say here that while the transformer architecture has become the de facto standard for natural language processing tasks, its application to computer vision remains limited. In vision, attention is either applied in conjunction with the convolutional networks or used to replace certain components of convolutional networks while keeping their overall structure in place. We show that this reliance on the convolutional neural networks is not necessary and a pure transformer that's without any convolutional neural networks applied directly to sequences of image patches can perform very well on image classification tasks. They even go ahead to tell us that when pre-trained on large amounts of data and transferred to multiple mid-sized or small image recognition benchmarks like the ImageNet, CIFAR, the VIT, that is a vision transformer, attains excellent results compared to the state-of-the-art conf nets like the efficient net while requiring substantially fewer computational resources to train. Now, it's possible that you've never heard of this term transformer or maybe you're from an electrical engineering background and you've only heard of this when it comes to stepping up and stepping down electric power. Now, we are going to go straight away to explain terms like the transformer or even this attention which was mentioned. To better understand the transformer and the role it has to play in this VIT architecture right here, we would have to get back in time to understand why they were first developed. In 2017, this paper entitled Attention is All You Need was first developed by Vaswani et al. And it has turned out to be one of the most influential papers in the modern deep learning era with the development of this transformer architecture right here. At the heart of this transformer architecture, we have this self-attention models. And more specifically in this paper, they used the scale dot product attention that we could see here. But then, as we said, the whole uh, purpose or the domain in which these kinds of architectures all these kinds of networks were built was for natural language processing. But the question is, how does this work in natural language processing? To understand how and why the attention and also the transformers are used in natural language processing, we'll take the following example, which is that of um, translation, which we used to already do in with Google Translate. So here we're going to put in I love the weather, or could you say, the weather today is amazing, and we translate this to French, le temps aujourd'hui, incroyable. Now, initially, the kinds of deep learning techniques which were used in solving these kinds of problems, that is, taking us from one language to another, were the recurrent neural networks. The way these recurrent neural networks work is quite simple. So we'll start by putting in the text here. Here we've put out our example from Google Translate and then we've added this extra blocks right here. Now these blocks we've seen here are recurrent neural network blocks. Recurrent neural networks generally reading RNNs here 
are one of the first deep learning based models used in natural language processing tasks like the case of translation we have here. Now the way this works is we have our uh, initial text or we have our, our source that's English text the weather today is amazing and then we have the target which we want to generate. So initially we have uh, this input and this output which we're going to train and later on when we pass in some random input we expect to get a reasonable output. Now the way we have this or uh, the, the way this is structured is such that each and every one of this is called a token. So we have this uh, word here which is a token this, this is our first token, next token, this token, this token, and this other token. Then these different tokens have been converted into vectors and then been passed in this RNN blocks right here. Now we carry out some simple computations like multiplication and addition and then some information is being passed in from one block to another, hence the term the recurrent neural network. Now the importance of passing information from one block to another is that this token's computations in this block will depend on this other previous tokens that you could see here. So it depends on this, depends on this, and also depends on this other one. And then once we're done with convert or passing this information from one block to another up to this, we are then gonna take this here. We're gonna have some information which is gonna be passed onto this other. Uh, RNN block here. So this is our encoder block. So here we encode the information and then here we decode this information. So here we have the encoder and the decoder. And then again here a similar process is, is repeated where we have this computations which produce an output here and then we could take this output and feed it in this one to produce this other output and so on and so forth up to this final output. But then the problem with this technique or with this method is that first of all, if we have a very long text, then it may happen that it starts becoming difficult for information to flow from this first blocks here to this final blocks. And given that even as humans, we know the importance of taking into consideration some previous context when trying to carry out a tax like for example translation this kind of problem will lead to very poor results now another problem here is each time we're training we have to pass this information from one block to another sequentially so here we pass all this information sequentially and because this information is passed sequentially it makes it difficult for us to implement parallelization very efficiently. And so this makes the training of these kinds of neural networks very difficult. Now, to tackle the issue with long-term dependencies, attention networks were developed. So right here, instead of depending on just this final vector we get, or this final output we get from this hidden layer here, which has been passed on here, to relay this information from the source to the target language. What we'll do is for each and every unit we have here, each and every recurrent neural network block we have here, we are going to take into consideration inputs from each and every block here. So this inputs will be taken into consideration. So each and every block now, you see all of this is passed. And then we have this attention layer right here, which then processes this inputs from this different uh, source RNN blocks, such that the uh, layer the, or this attention layer produces an output vector, which is now passed as input into this uh, RNN block. And so when we have this source and this target, we pass in the source, then we get or uh, we combine those inputs from each and every RNN block right here. Pass in this as input into this uh, RNN block. Get an output. In this case, it's le. Then we take this output and pass it as an input in here. 
but again once we shift and go to and get to this time where or this time frame where we want to get this second output what we'll do is we'll have another tension here which again takes in all these different inputs so we take again all these different inputs here and here and here and here then carry out some computations based on the type of attention we are implementing and then from here we get an output which is passed together with this le right here so from here we get this output and then we repeat the same step that's passing in the the tone that is taking this output passing in here and then also taking in this um, inputs from this different rnm blocks and so as you can see here for each and every block we have here it pays attention to each and every input and for this or uh, from this we could even come up with an attention map where we would have uh, this text this text in english the weather today is amazing and then this other side we have le temps aujourd'hui est incroyable so now after training this kind of model we can be able to see how much attention this le pays to each and every input here and it's but logical that this le will pay the most attention to the and then ton ton actually uh here is weather so this will pay more attention to or most attention to weather then aujourd'hui will pay most attention to today aujourd'hui is today et will pay most attention to is and inquire will pay most attention to amazing and if we get to this paper entitled Neural Machine Translation by Jointly Learning to Align and Translate, that is a famous Badenau AR paper, you can see some of these attention maps here. Let's have this. You see some of these attention maps. The, you see, uh, la, la course sur la zone économique européenne a été signée en août uh, 1982. And you have an end then the agreement on the european economic area was signed in august 1992 so you see this attention maps here where we see clearly which words attend most to one another so here we have this image which shows exactly what we we're describing previously so here you have this inputs and then to get this output y of t you will find that we are going to take in or we're going to attend to each and every input here and then uh pass this here to obtain our y t now at this point we are going to move on from the attention to self attention and to better explain the self attention we'll consider a whole different problem which is that of sentiment analysis so here we want to we have this model we could we could now take this off we don't uh make use of this although you should note that we still use sent uh, self attention in the translation problems but it will be easier to grasp this concept in the context of sentiment analysis so here what we are having is we we have the weather today is amazing i want to be able to say whether this is a positive or a negative statement so now we have this model which takes in inputs like this and then let's draw this model here like this we have this uh, model and then outputs or uh, tells us whether the statement we've made is a positive or a negative statement now here or for this self-attention or uh, layer we are not gonna need this uh, recurrent neural network hidden states anymore in fact what we could do is we could take all this off actually because basically we having this self-attention model which we'll see in a minute uh how it works and then what we're passing in here is some vectors so we have this vector we have this other vector we have this vector this one and finally this one now if we combine all this we'll find that we have a sequence length so we have one two three four five suppose that our sequence length is five so we have a sequence length by 
let's say embedding dimension metrics which we which we get from here now let me explain let's suppose that the sequence length is five as we've all seen and then the embedding dimension is let's say three so we have this five by three metrics which we are going to pass into this self attention layer right here now this embedding or these vectors which we pass into the self attention unit are going to be designed in a way that words which look alike are going to be close to each other while words which are opposites are going to be far away from each other now let's uh since we're, we're working in, in three dimensions it means we'll have a one two three values here one two three and then finally here one two three so let's let's do something like this in three dimensions what we'll have is the word happy which in this case can be represented by this vector or this embedding would be uh, or can be plotted out like this and this will be close to a word like smile while a word like sad a word like sad will be far away from this uh, two words because they are actually opposites to each other so we have sad and we could have angry right here now for this one here or for this text here we could pick out these two words which are most likely to be very close to each other we could have the right here and we have is somewhere around here and so now getting back to this model we have this five by three input which is passed into our self attention layer so we, we could let's let's have this matrix here five by three would have the the word the here would have its own embedding so we would have some value some value some value let's suppose that we're working in three-dimensional embedding and then weather will have its own value its own value its own value today its own value this value this value you could you could take say 2.3 1 0 0.5 negative 5 1 whatever value one year and then you have this and you have this and you have this this is four already and then amazing would have its own so you see that each and every one of this here has its own embedding so this is these are the different words we have here then at this point we'll implement a special type of attention known as a dot product attention where we'll take this here and multiply it by the transpose of a matrix which has the same shape as this matrix here so we'll take this we'll call this the query and then we'll multiply this by the transpose of the key now this key is going to be 3 by 5 since it's going to have the same shape as this query now this is our query we'll call this a query and so here now we have um, this 3 by 5 matrix and then this product will give us a 5 by 5 matrix now after this or after getting this 5 by 5 matrix we could pass this through a softmax layer now we've looked at the softmax layer in previous sessions but uh, one thing you should note here is once we have this 5x5 five five matrix, it produces this attention map similar to what we have seen before, where we have this the weather today is amazing to the side and the same again to the side. And then words which are most similar to each other in a certain context are going to have uh, the highest values. And so if we're in the case where you had, uh, say, let's replace this weather by happy and then we have uh amazing let's uh no let's let, let's leave amazing so if we have the happy today is amazing uh it sure doesn't make sense but let's consider this let's suppose that we have the happy today is amazing then this uh second row of foot column because amazing will be around here so we will have this value which is going to be relatively higher than all the other surrounding values and this will be because after training the model the attention map values would have been modified such that values or rather words which are similar to one another 
take higher values while words which are not similar to one another take very small values now from here we have this uh five by five metrics which now when multiplied by another five by three metrics will give us a five by three metrics generally we call this metrics which is multiplied by this attention metrics the value so we have query we have the key and we have the value and with this you see that we have this input which got in here which was five by three and now we have a five by three output then this year now we pass through some fully connected layers and then we'll have an output or a fully connected layer with one neuron in this output which will tell us whether an input statement is a positive statement or a negative statement and so as you've seen we've gotten rid completely of the recurrent neural network blocks as now we're just making use of this self-attention blocks to extract information from our inputs now one of the first papers if not the first paper which made use of just the attention and getting rid of the rnns was this attention is all you need paper and it happens to be one of the most influential papers in modern day deep learning so here in this attention is all you need the paper or the transformer paper to present this new network which you could see just right here and then a single uh, block let's take this off a single block which makes up the transformer model is this multi-head attention so as you could see right here we have this uh, single block and then here we have this multi-head attention so let's look at this multi-head attention this is actually the multi-head attention here so you have this here which is this whole uh, block and then in this multi-head attention you have the skill dot product attention which is this self attention we just talked about you see we have the, the query the key and the value so since it's self attention you will notice here that the, we have this inputs and all these come from the same input so we have this um, input which is split up into cure k and v query key and value now this uh, resembles or is analogous to data management systems where uh, data is stored in key value pairs just like uh, say Python dictionary so you have data in this key value pairs uh, data stored this way and then when you want a particular information you have to pass in a query now when you pass in a query let's change this color when you pass in a query you have a particular key which is selected once the key is selected, we now obtain the value, which is the data itself. And it's uh, kind of similar to what we're having here. And then from here, in this uh, level of the split, note that uh, before the information has been passed into this skill.product attention, we actually pass this Q, K, and V into some different linear layers. And so this means that even though we have the same input, they will end up being projected into three different inputs and so now we have this cure kv we are going to carry out cure k transpose here we have uh, the mat mall as we saw already cure times k transpose and then we have this scaling which you can see right here in this formula this attention formula we have cure kt divided by this dk then from here we have softmax of all this and then we multiply by v so let's get back up to this here that's fine now that we have this output you now see that we have this multi-head so we, we we got this we have the softmax we have the mall where we take this softmax of this multiply by v so that's how we get this recall how we saw that with the example we had previously and then we have this multi-head attention now this multi-head attention here simply means you take this here as you pass in your information like this you get this uh, cure k and v and then 
you again pass the same information into this block so let's suppose that this is our scale dot product attention block this is scale dot product attention which is right inside here and so once we have this let's let's make that smaller let's suppose that this is what we have here so this here is actually this now to obtain the multi-head attention we would have this other one here and then we'll have let's suppose that we have three heads if we have three heads then we would have three of this stacked in this way you have one two let's change the color so it becomes clearer we have this one in red we have this next one in blue here and then we have this other one in green so there we go we have this three and then when the information gets in so you have your cure you have your k and you have your v we pass this through uh this separate linear layers see for for each of this we have some linear layer here all of this came from the same inputs as you could see here and then now this information is passed here so we have cure kv pass into this one into this block here and then this same cure kv also is passed into let's change the color we will now have some other here some other linear layers let's put it besides this we have some other linear layers here we'll pass v we will pass k we'll pass q right here and then this now will be sent into this self-attention block right here then we also finally have this for the red so we would have something like this red we have the k something like this we have the v something like this so now this cure kv is passed now into this red here and that's it and then the outputs here the outputs we'll get at the end of this three self-attention blocks will now be concatenated and then pass through a linear layer so this linear layer is, is like our dense layer in terms of flow now once we have this you see we have our multi-head attention which is this block and then now we'll take this input add it onto the output and then go through a layer normalization then from here we we get pass this through a feed forward network uh that's like our fully connected network or dense layer and then we will get again repeat this addition and normalization it looks similar to what we have with the rest nets now once we have this now we can then repeat this n times now you notice that this is similar to this except for the fact that now we have this two multi head attentions and we also have this masked anyway we're not going to get into all those details what's important is for you to understand how this encoder here works and now we understand how this works we will now get back to our vid paper that is this paper entitled transformers for image recognition at scale and now you should be able to understand this transformer block which we presented earlier in this paper with this understanding of how this transformer encoder works let's now get into this uh unit here where we break this image into this different patches as we could see right here to better understand how and why we make use of patches right here let's not forget that what this transformer encoder takes in is some input sequence so we have this input here uh initially we had words where each word uh, like this could be represented by this vector or this embedding vector and then this now combined is passed into the transformer here since our input is this image in order for us to represent it this way we would have to break this up so what we could do or what we could think of at uh, first sight is we have this image let's suppose the image is 256 by 256 by say three three channels then we could take each and every pixel here so let's let's omit the the, the channel from the channels for now so what we could have here is for each and every pixel in this 256 by 256 image we would have a vector representing that pixel and then this other one is vector this other one is vector and so on and so forth but don't forget that unlike previously where we had only five words now we have 256 times 256 words because if we have an image like this and we have to get each and every pixel then we'll have 256 by 256 
which is more than 65,000 different uh, vectors which we will have to pass here. And so, before, where in our attention model, we had an attention map which was 5 by 5. Recall, we saw that already with the words, we had a 5. Uh, uh, an input sentence with five words we had five by five attention map now we would have a 65,000 by 65,000 attention map you see that working with this kinds of matrices and memory isn't very feasible and so instead of going pixel by pixel the authors decide to work patch by patch let's uh, increase this again so you get to see that take this off you see here we go patch by patch so you could see um, how this image instead of taking uh, each pixel we break this up into patches so this is now like a pixel and then you see this patch you see this patch this patch this other patch this patch, and so on and so forth up to this patch right here now this is what uh, is like the word now here so with images, we have to break this up like this and the authors choose to work with 16 by 16 pixel patches. So each patch here is 16 by 16. And so given that we have 16 by 16, if we have this patch, for example, then we would have 256 different pixels for each patch. Here we have 256, here we have 256 and so on and so forth. So unlike with the images, or rather unlike with the words where we had uh, five by three, so we had five words and each word was represented by a three-dimensional vector, here each patch is represented by the 256 dimensional vector. Now this doesn't mean that uh, in NLP we generally work with this. We, this was uh, just done to make it easier for you to understand. So getting back to computer vision, you see that we have this 256, 256, 256, and so on and so forth. Now, when working with the transformer, we may not want to work with this 256 dimensional vectors. Maybe we want to work with, say, uh, 512 dimensional vectors. In that case, we would have to do this linear projection of the flattened patches such that we leave from this um say let's suppose that we have one two three we have nine patches so the sequence line is nine so we have this input which is nine by 256 and then after going through this linear projection we now get to nine by 512 and this will be the embedding dimension for our transformer in the previous example our embedding dimension was three so if w this this permits us to be to to work flexibly as now we could decide on uh, what size we want for our embedding dimension. Now that said, we have this output. You see nine by five hundred and twelve, and then we're ready to pass this into the transformer encoder. But just before passing this, we would add this position embeddings. You see there th we we have this input. You see in this different this color. You have them getting in and then we have this position embeddings here is notice zero one two three and up to nine now the way this works or or let's start by first the reason why we even have to do this is because unlike with the conf nets where where the convolutional or the way the convolutional neural networks work is that for computing the feature maps it takes into consideration locality so this means that you see these two portions here um when passed with a conf filter will produce a certain output and so this means that pixels which belong to a certain or uh, to a small locality like this one will be used to produce the output and this clearly gives an uh gives the cnns an upper hand over the transformers as when trying to understand an image, the positions of particular pixels actually matter. So this means that CNNs already have an inductive bias due to the way they actually work. And so to give a helping hand to the transformer network, we'll now need or we we'll need this position embedding, which gives this transformer encoder an idea 
of the location of each and every patch which is passed in but again it should be noted that this will have to be learned uh, automatically by the model now if you notice we have this extra input right here and the reason why we have this extra input is simply because we do not want a situation where after going through this encoder or this transformer encoder right here we pick one of this outputs because we would have outputs here we don't want we don't want to pick one of these outputs to be used for the mlp head or to be used for this fully connected network in this classification unit right here so to avoid this uh sort of bias where we would be picking one of this the authors add this extra learnable class embedding right here which will be uh, or whose output will be passed into this MLP head and then will be used for classification. Another important point to note here is the transformer encoder or this uh, visual vision transformers are some sort of hybrid architecture because we may decide not to pass in those image patches directly but instead pass those image patches to a convolutional neural network then get the output embeddings and pass in here directly instead of this image patches it should be noted that the multi-layer perceptron contains two fully connected layers with a jlu non-linearity here's the general jlu non-linearity uh compared to the relu and the elu so you see we have this relu where all values less than zero all values less than zero uh gives output of zero and all values greater than zero give the exact same value but with the jlu we have this curved function right here so that's it the type of normalization is the layer normalization as we mentioned already and the layer normalization here we could visualize this in this paper by sheng et al uh, entitled power norm rethinking batch normalization in transformers where you see we let's zoom this you see we have layer normalization here and we have the batch normalization put side by side so or with the layer normalization as we were saying if you consider some inputs let's let's here we have the sequence length or the sequence dimension we have the features or the embeddings or like a vector actually so we have the different vectors and then we have the batch dimension so basically what we're saying is we have in this sequence length or uh, we have these different vectors here which have been passed into some layer and then instead of doing or carrying out normalization for for throughout the batches as is in the case of the batch norm here we carrying out this normalization for each in every vector and the reason why we do not use the batch norm with the transformers is the fact that the batch statistics for NLP data have a very large variance throughout training. And this variance exists in the corresponding gradients as well. And so to avoid this kind of situation, it's preferable for us to carry out this normalization on the features instead. Before we move on to the experiments, let's look at how the vits are being used in real world so actually the vits uh, are pre-trained on very large data sets and fine-tuned to smaller downstream tasks obviously when fine-tuning we remove this head and replace with uh, a head which now correspond to our number of classes so this means that initially we may have a thousand class head and then we move this to k classes or let's say three class head to better understand why we're going from uh why we, we have a d by k output let's uh get back here so after this inputs have been passed in here we have an output sequence length plus one this plus is one year uh, or let's, let's just say we have here we have say from here a one by d output 
if if we're considering all the sequence length it will be a sequence length by d output this d here is our embedding dimension which we had fixed from this linear projection right here so we have this um one by d and then uh we pass this through obviously it becomes it becomes like simply uh d neurons so we have one two we now have d neurons since it's just one by d and then we have this output let's say we have a thousand classes then we'll have this fully connected layer which uh brings all this here this d inputs to this k outputs or in this case to this 1000 outputs now when we want to fine tune when we want to fine tune we're going to take this off take this off and replace this now with k outputs so we now have k outputs right here and then we initialize this weight of this fully connected layer the authors also make mention of the fact that during fine tuning is better to work at higher resolutions so this means that the model could be trained at 256 by 256 and then later on fine-tuned with 512 by 512 images and then since they keep the patch size the same this results in a larger effective sequence length now let's explain or let's visualize this uh, statement so here we have this input which is say 48 by 48 let's say we have here 48 by 48 and when we divide this or we break this up into three parts we have 16 16 16 16 16 16 so we have 16 by 16 patches now if we want to fine tune on a higher resolution image then uh let's say the higher resolution image is say 96 by 96 so we could have something like this so if now we're fine tuning on the 96 by 96 image and that we still maintain the fact that this year or the patches will be 16 by 16 then this means that instead of three year we're going to have six so we, we now have or oh, one two three four five and six patches six patches this way two three four five six and so on and so forth so now we're going to have um 36 different patches instead of nine patches as we have here and that's why they make mention of the fact that the sequence length is going to be increased and that's uh so long as they can fit in the memory now due to these modifications the pre-trained that's what we had before the pre-trained position embeddings may no longer be meaningful so they therefore perform 2d interpolation of the pre-trained position embeddings according to their location in the original image the experiments here we we could see those different models the, they have the vid base the vid large and the vid huge number of parameters 86 million to 632 million then here we have 12 layers recall let's get back here recall we have this number of layers here so basically you're repeating this you're repeating this here 12 times so we get back so there we have 12 layers for the vid base as stated here and then we have 24 for the large and 32 for vid huge and then this hidden size this d this embedding dimension is 768 for base 1024 for large and 1280 for huge uh, the MLP size that's uh, fully connected layers uh, 3072, 4096, here 5120. Then the number of heads, remember the attention heads 12, 16, 16. So this MLP size here, they're talking about uh, this MLPs. Recall we have, we have this MLP, we have this MLP right here. And so uh, the, this MLP is made of two fully connected layers like this then depending on the size you have a certain number of neurons the experiments were carried out on this GFT 300 million data set and we see how this 14 by 14 patch version of the VIT outperforms this ResNet 152 now 
this uh, performance, although not largely uh, greater than that of the rest nets, requires less computation resources to train. As we see here, we have 2,500 TPU core days required to train this model as compared to this one, which requires 9,900 TPU core days. Also from these plots, you see that when you increase the number of pre-training samples, the model which performs the best is this VIT right here. See here, we have this VIT and this outperforms the rest nets, whereas uh, for a reduced number of samples, the rest nets outperforms the VITs. While here, the smaller the patch size, like here we have this 14, 14 by 14 patch size, we have the better the results. Now, in order to understand the reason why, as you increase this uh, data set size, the VITs start to outperform the ConfNets. We have to recall that when working with ConfNets like the ResNet, there is some inductive bias in the sense that the fact that this ResNet takes as input this two-dimensional image already gives this ConfNet a helping hand when it comes to extracting features from here. And so even with relatively smaller data sets, this confidence can make sense out of this input image. Now with the transformers, which are some sort of generic neural network, the model doesn't get to see the image in this its natural form. What it sees is some patches which have been converted to some vectors. And so at the very beginning or uh, uh, with small data, the transformer model finds it difficult to make much sense out of these patches. But as soon as we increase this data set to considerable amounts, this transformer model, now free of the inductive bias, can even do better than the confnets. And Interesting enough, you notice that after training a transformer model, this position embeddings, we call the position embeddings, which are added onto the patch embeddings before passing to the transformer, actually learn on their own to encode the position of the patches. You could see from this uh, plot here where we have the input patch row and the input patch column. You see that this uh, one, one, you see the position, this is gotten by the model uh, or this is learned automatically by the model during the training process. You see two, one, it goes a step in this direction uh, and maintains this direction or maintains a row. And uh, you see three, one, maintains a row, but goes three steps. You see this, you see, you see that. And then finally here you go you go seven steps to the right and then seven steps uh, downward. Then here to the left you could look at this you see this um, this embedded filters right here we have this embedded filters which we see here which look much alike to the f the the confnet filters. Then to the right you have this plot which summarizes the reason why the VITs end up being more powerful than the confnets. To understand this, let's take this here, we'll, we'll consider a confnet with a given depth. Now, with a confnet, the initial layers, let's, let's, let's have this confnet and we break this up. So we break this up, we have our initial layers and then we have our final layers. These initial layers permit us um, extract low level features while the final layers permit us extract high level features. And so if we have an image like this, like this one, and we have this head and we have this, then given that we're passing this filters or this confnet filters here, you'll see that this pixel, for example, attends to these other pixels which are found around its locality. 
and then as we go deeper in the network we would have this pixel here which now tries to attend to this other pixel here which is much more far away from it to better picture this remember the example we took for three or rather two three by three filters compared to a single five by five filter let's 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 draw this here we compared this with a single five by five filter and we saw that although this five by five filter had a larger receptive field compared to a single three by three filter which we have here making or stacking up this three by three filters that is making our network deeper permitted us to still be able to capture this uh, part of the image and so this shows us that uh, with the confidence in the earlier layers when the when is not yet deep enough we're still capturing this local information and then as we go deeper we start capturing much more global information and so if we were to have this kind of plot here where this we have mean attention distance and here we have the network depth we would see that for a confnet we will keep increasing this up to a point where we may we will no longer be able to continue increasing because uh as this net this network depth or this we increase the number of layers we are able to capture much more global features and so this um mean attention distance keeps increasing but with the attention or with the transformers since each patch attends to each and every other patch as we have seen already with the self attention each and every patch will attend to uh, the other right from the very first attention layer we are not going to have this but instead this plot we have here and so this means that if we train our VIT with a very large data set right from the very first layers we are able to capture both the local and the global features and this is what makes the VITs more powerful compared to the confnets when we work with big data here we can also visualize what the model sees by looking at this attention maps you'll notice that after training the model you see we have this attention here see here these are pixels which pay much attention to one another see here these pixels are paying uh attention or much more attention to one another as compared to the other pixels in summary to understand or to visualize what goes on when training to cnn and vit model side by side you would see here that with the vits as you increase this data side this increase data size and this is increased data size here so as we increase the the data size or rather when we start with small data sizes we have this kind of accuracy while for the cnns we already have reasonable accuracies even with small data size and then as we keep increasing this data size as we keep increasing this data size you see this accuracy keeps increasing while for the cnns start to plateau at some point and this plateauing is simply comes due to the fact that this cnns here are limited by the inductive biases whereas this transformers which are more generic neural networks are free to learn even better from this larger data sets.